So the topic of today's talk um, is dealing with data scarcity and deep learning. Um, I'll kind of start off with a high-level overview of kind of various techniques and kind of um, you know settings in which uh, you know we have uh, uh, you know try to try to achieve the the results of deep learning you know even when we don't have you know massive data sets uh, available. Um, in particular, um, at least in, in, in my segment of the talk, I'm going to focus um, quite a bit on attempts to um, get benefit from uh, using uh, active learning uh, with deep models. Um, and I'll discuss, first of all, just kind of some basic sort of like proof of concept work of trying to determine, um, you know, what are good acquisition functions and does this work and on what tasks, you know, some describe some empirical work to see uh, how much we can rely on these tools. And then uh, in the second part of my part, I will try to um, uh, describe a couple papers that look a little bit more realistically at the labeling process. Um, in a lot of active learning, we tend to just think like, I pass the example to uh, some black box, like some you know, cartoon human who gives me the label. Um, people who actually work in crowdsourcing don't think this is how labeling works, because um, it's not. Uh, so in uh, a couple of works, uh, we'll look at one, uh, how we deal with um, the noisy crowdsource data, try to integrate learning and crowdsourcing. Um, and also in another uh, paper that I'll describe, we, we look at how to deal with a, a more realistic view of the annotation procedure itself, which often doesn't you know, consist of, I, I hand you an image and you tell me which of a thousand categories it belongs to, but I get to say, ask a bunch of yes, no questions. Um, this is the type of thing we can actually rely on a crowd worker for. Um, then I'm gonna uh, pass uh, the baton over to Anima Anandkumar, uh, professor at Caltech, and, and until recently, my boss um, at uh, Amazon AI, um, who's gonna describe some other kind of advanced techniques and areas she's exploring, including uh, how to use generative models for data augmentation, and some newer approaches to semi-supervised learning and domain adaptation. So, um, in short, um, we all, I mean, I think at this point don't have to really spend a lot of time um, motivating why we're interested in deep learning in particular. Um, I started my PhD at kind of like an auspicious time of around 2013. When I got there, there had just been some, I think probably a couple of years before I started PhD. Uh, I guess for me it's just hearsay because I was a musician, I wasn't um, a machine learning researcher, but I understand if you told people you were working on neural networks, uh, you know, you got a fair amount of skepticism. Around the time that I started, there was a consensus that there's something happening involving deep neural networks um, that for basically uh, well-supported, like large data set computer vision tasks. Um, but, you know, basically outside of computer vision, this stuff doesn't really work. Uh, then um, there became more of a consensus that actually for various problems in um, natural language processing, um, you know, things in healthcare, machine translation, uh, state-of-the-art speech recognition started, uh, systems started switching over. There's kind of a consensus that, in general, this is sort of the go-to toolkit for solving uh, sort of predictive modeling problems. So these are our best function approximators that we have right now, at least when we have lots of data. Um, you know, there's some less known breakthroughs, so uh, with a colleague, uh, we showed that we can also choreograph uh, Dance Dance Revolution uh, choreography using deep neural networks. So you, know, you could do any kind of like weird sort of structured prediction task. As long as you have lots of data, um, this is something we're sort of all a bit excited about. Um, and industry is quite excited about. Um, and the contributors to success here are, I think, as modelers, as researchers, we want to believe that we are responsible for what's happening here. So it's we've uh, come up with really fancy new algorithms. Um, I think there's a quite reasonable perspective that would say the, the core ideas have been in place since the late 80s, certainly by the late 90s. Um, convolutional neural networks, recurrent neural networks, the precise sort of memory cell that you know, we can't seem to shake, the LSTM was already invented in the mid-1990s, and that the, the key drivers of success are that we have more computation, so we're able to maybe iterate a bit more quickly, and um, equally pressing that we have, uh, we're often operating in a different regime in terms of the amount of data that we have access to. 
So we're not uh, doing papers where we say I have 2,000 images, but we're saying I have 1 million images. So um, among the sort of like, you know, this, this is just sort of one among, I think, uh, a number of like big yawning challenges right now uh, that, you know, sort of clarify how, you know, just uh, throwing deep neural networks at things isn't the sort of end of the story for, for most of the problems we care about. Um, the, the problem in particular that we're going to look at here is the sort of extreme data dependency of a lot of deep neural networks. Um, there's other problems that we care about, like um, we're, we're really good at making predictions, but we're not necessarily so great at, um, you know, estimating the effects of interventions. Um, and, you know, are, are we kind of, how can we make more progress on, say, causal inference and counterfactual analysis is a, another talk someone else could give and do a better job than I could. Um, we um, have systems that are quite brittle, so they tend to break even under, they tend to depend on sort of superficial statistics of the data and to break under even kind of minor distribution shift. And um, yeah, so, and you know, even things like deep reinforcement learning that sort of do deal with the effects of actions also are extremely, um, data dependent. So to give just a sense of like the data scale that we're often looking at, um, so computer vision systems now are sort of by default always trained on, you know, in excess of say a million images. Um, typical uh, competitive speech recognition systems are trained on in excess of 11,000 hours of annotated phonemes. Um, uh, for, for other kind of natural language uh, processing tasks, like say to give you a sense of the scale for uh, named entity recognition, uh, we have 625,000 annotated words in the onto notes corpus. In English, it's a similar number of words um, in the other supported languages, and these are the kinds of data sets that um, we often need in order to be able to get, you know, kind of really meaningful results. So, and, and, and you know, a, a big part of what's so great about neural networks is that they actually get an advantage when you go into these really large data scales, right? Um, not every approach that we have uh, is going to continue to do better as we throw more and more and more data at it. So on one hand, the, uh, there, there's, there's a good story, which is that we have systems that, whose performance doesn't really saturate. Uh, the downside is just that, um, you know, we, to get to the kinds of performance that we're sort of excited about for a lot of industrial applications, we need a lot more data than, say, um, many people who aren't like multi-billion dollar companies have access to. Um, there's a lot of different strategies to cope with scarce data. And um, in thinking about like how to present this material, uh, it occurred to me that really you can, you can make the problem general enough as to be completely vacuous, right? You could describe all of what we're doing as just trying to deal with scarce data because if you had uh, a near in the limit as you had a near infinite amount of data, then actually like, you know, you could just use uh, nearest, you know, if you had a near infinite amount of data and you had unlimited computation, then you could just use the nearest neighbor classifier and you're fine, right? So, um, you know, there's a question of what assumptions are we making? Um, some of the approaches that people use to try to get more juice out of their data include uh, approaches towards data augmentation. So things like I'm going to apply all kinds of random transformations to, uh, you know, for whatever sorts of invariance classes I can't explicitly build into my model, I'm going to deal with it by um, actually augmenting my data to simulate, you know, having more, you know, for say, for a single image, I can have every single variety of it within some invariance class by say, uh, creating, you know, various uh, crops and rotations and shifts and color skews. Um, there's a question, you know, semi-supervised learning sort of speaks to learning from scarce data. It says, hey, I have lots of examples, um, but I don't necessarily have lots of labels. So how do I deal with the fact that I have, um, how can I at least get some extra juice out of the unlabeled data? Um, transfer learning speaks to the case where, say, I don't have a lot of labeled data. Uh, data data scarce in my target task, but I have some related task. Can I can I can I bring this to bear? Um, and uh, domain adaptation is kind of a very special case of transfer learning, where we say if we make uh, if our if our if our source task and our target task are really the same task, just that there's uh, some kind of some kind of uh, perturbation to the distribution. Somehow our source distribution and target distribution are different from each other. Is there a way that uh, we can recover? Um, and depending on what assumptions you make, and you have to make some, sometimes you can recover even if you don't have any labels for your target task. So I could describe you know, one such case soon. And then um, 
you know, the, the meat of this talk that, at least from my section that I'm going to dive into, is uh, active learning, where in this case, uh, the, the kind of structure that we assume is that we have access to uh, the annotation mechanism. So as we're learning, we can make um, sort of intelligent decisions. Rather than just say, I'm going to grab a subset of all the examples I can access, I'm going to grab an IID uh, subset that I can afford to label, and I'm going to get them annotated. Um, with active learning, we say, I'm going to judiciously choose which examples to annotate and you know, send them off to a human. Right? So kind of considerations that we make for, you know, to decide sort of what techniques are appropriate are, are, are the examples scarce? Um, or is it just that the labels are scarce? Um, do we have access to the kind of annotation mechanisms? Or are, we, are we allowed to um, sort of query on the fly? Um, do we have um, labels for related tasks? And you know, just how related are those tasks? So um, in terms of uh, approaches to semi-supervised learning right now with deep learning, um, there, there's sort of a, a number of approaches that have been investigated. There's uh, a common thing is to say, I'm going to use the full set of data, including the unlabeled data, to learn representations, um, say, by like learning uh, an autoencoder that's going to learn a compact representation of my data. And I could do that with all the data, including both the labeled and unlabeled data. And then using this representation that I've learned, given all the data, on a subset that's labeled, I could learn my classifier. So I get the advantage of you know, operating in some kind of like lower dimensional space. Um, some successful approaches in the past that sort of had this flavor include the ladder networks um, from Valpola. Um, you know, a lot of approaches have the flavor of you know, saying that my loss consists of some kind of you know, regularization term as some kind of class classification penalty where I could basically um, you know, apply the classification part of my loss on the labeled data, but I can enforce smoothness or you know, whatever this regularizer is uh, to hold on all of my data. And, um, a lot of the uh, current state of the art for deep learning with semi-supervised approaches, at least in the computer vision domain, um, a lot of them based on this paper by Lane, and I think the most recent state of the art uh, in semi-supervised with computer vision is this paper by uh, um, Andrew Gordon Wilson's student, um, Ben Athwaratkun. Um, he actually was an intern with us at Amazon, so I should do a better job of pronouncing his name, but I hope, you'll pull, hope you hope you know, forgives me. Um, and these approaches actually look at the prediction that the model makes over the course of training and uses a sort of like a, a proxy label. I look at, I'm going to train the model across multiple rounds and I'm going to look at what prediction it made uh, on the unlabeled data and take this like vote across multiple rounds of training as sort of a proxy label and enforce essentially that the model is uh, making consistent predictions over the course of training. It's, it's sort of a heuristic, but it seems to work really well. Um, and so they're able to get, you know, not so far away from, say, state-of-the-art performance on like CIFAR 10, CIFAR 100, using only a, a relatively small subset. So like 4,000 examples, 10,000 examples versus 50,000. All right. Um, so, you know, probably one of the major successes, perhaps like the most useful tool in a lot of cases for, for, for learning with scarce data is um, pre-training on some related task. Uh, the intuition here is that uh, the features themselves are what is very data hungry, that learning the classifier given the right features uh, doesn't require so much work. And uh, we, can, we can learn uh, that the features themselves actually tend to be somewhat general. If you train a classifier to do 1,000 way classification, then given some new class, given two new classes supported by a small amount of data, you might only really need to learn uh, the, the classifier and some small tweaks. I think if we had a, a great theory for why transfer learning via these kinds of pre-training heuristics actually worked, people would be dancing in the streets. Because like, these are the kinds of improvements that um, if, you, if, you, if they flowed, flowed from some kind of anything but like a kind of somewhat intuitive hack, I think you know, there's sort of empirical improvements we rarely see, right? Uh, you might have uh, 200 examples of each class where if you were just training on that task, you would require you know, many thousands of examples or tens or hundreds of thousands, you could have a few hundred examples and get the same accuracy just by virtue of using an off-the-shelf pre-trained neural network. Um, you know, there was a nice paper in 2015. It was a very empirical paper, but tried to study precisely what's going on. At least, can we empirically get a grasp for um, 
why are these features transferable, or at least even which features are transferable, looking at like when I, when I pre-train the network and then I you know, adapt it to the new task. Uh, you know, so they did this by just dividing ImageNet in half and saying I'm gonna pre-train on uh, some of the categories and apply the model to the other categories. Can I see, say, you know, depending on which layers I carry over from the original network. So Jason Yosinski had this nice paper at NIPS in 2015 where they look at um, do I fine tune when I trained it or do I freeze those layers? And which layer do I do the transfer at? And at the time, you know, you look at, oh, I have a choice over eight different layers for doing the freezing, and I have for each one, do I do the fine tuning or not? And I think at the time in like 2014, 2015, this was uh, a huge amount of computation to do this each time training from scratch on ImageNet. Um, um, and, but, you know, I think there's actually been Curiously little follow-up considering how effective this technique is. It, it could be that just really understanding why it works requires some deep understanding of the optimization of neural networks that's sort of right now currently lacking. Um, but it tends to work really, really well. So, you know. Um, now, a special case of transfer learning is, uh, you know, the domain adaptation problem. Um, in, in the context of deep learning and domain adaptation, um, it's often being approached in a very heuristic way right now. So um, there's, uh, for example, a lot of techniques that say, uh, there are a lot of papers coming out right now that say, um, well, uh, so, so to start off with, the sort of formal setup for domain adaptation most commonly, it says I have some source distribution P, I have some target distribution Q, and for the source distribution, I have um, labeled examples, but for the target distribution, I don't have any labels. And so the naive thing to do is say, I'm just going to train my classifier on the source distribution, apply it on the target, and hope for the best, right? And then the hope is, can we, can we do somehow better uh, by the fact that we actually get to observe the whole corpus of not labels, but at least of a whole bunch of inputs from the test period? Can we kind of compare these inputs from the test period uh, to the you know, inputs from the training period and see, you know, can we somehow adjust our model in some way to make it better? Um, so that ultimately our goal, right, is we want to predict well on the target data. Um, there's a lot of papers coming out right now that sort of just state the problem like this. They just say, hey, I have uh, labeled source data. I have unlabeled target data. We want to do a good job of prediction. Like, you know, let's dance. Um, the problem is this is impossible, right? Just stated without any further assumption. If I say I have a source distribution and target distribution that are different from each other, um, that's not by itself enough information to know that it's possible. So there's, um, for example, um, God could be uh, angry with us and he could decide that, or she could decide that actually the labeling function is going to just be turned upside down. That's the way that the target and source data are different from each other. Uh, cats are now called dogs and dogs are now, ca now called cats. Um, it, you could also have uh, a case where it's underspecified, right? So a lot of the cases that people look at in a lot of the deep domain adaptation cases, you say I have uh, MNIST digits, but then I'll have like bubble font MNIST digits. And who's to say that a bubble two corresponds to a, a, a straight line one, or a, stra a straight line two, and a bubble one corresponds to a straight line one? It could be that actually bubble two is the way the bubble people write one, and bubble one is the way the bubble people write two. If, if the supports for these distributions are completely different, um, then you can't prove anything necessarily, or you have to make some kind of assumption about what, sh some kind of structure that says what should align to what, right? Um, if the supports don't match, then you still have to at least, you know, you might be able to get away if, you know, you could come up with some kind of divergence between the two distributions, even if the, you know, like the supports don't match, but somehow the total variation distance or something between distributions is capped or something like that, you can get away. So, um, for example, to give, to give an example of the way you can kind of recover from this case and without any additional labeled data in a test period, still come away with a good classifier, um, one common assumption um, is that something about the, the generative process stays the same, right? So um, in a recent paper that we just presented at ICML, um, I investigated um, the, the label shift problem, which is sort of related to the maybe more familiar um, covariate shift problem, right? So here what we assume, uh, in label shift what we say is, is, is that the only difference between my training distribution and my, my source and my target distribution is, um, that basically the, the distribution of the labels changes. So I have a generative story which says I have some, I sample a label and then I generate an image given a label. And the process that generates an image given the label doesn't change between the source and the target period. 
what changes um, is just the label distribution. Now, the, the, so, so we, we essentially are saying we have two distributions, P and Q, and um, the joint distribution, uh, Q, could be represented as uh, Q of Y times P of X given Y. Um, this, this is because, you know, that, 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 that we could put in Q here just flows obviously from basic probability and we can replace it with P because um, this invariance holds. Um, covariate shift um, speaks to the opposite uh, assumption which says that basically I, I skew my um, P of X ver is different from Q of X, but once I fix X, uh, the label function is, stays the same. So P of Y given X is equal to Q of Y given X, right? Um, these actually, these types of assumptions uh, are, are sort of, um, they don't necessarily imply that there's a causal structure, but they, causal structure would imply these assumptions, right? So there's a nice correspondence between all these different assumptions you could make about the way the conditional probabilities are invariant and to what kind of causal structure would exist in your data. And they're nicely articulated in this paper by Bernard Shulkoff from 2012. Um, on causal and anti-causal learning. So label shift, right, essentially says my label causes the image. Or, my, you know, my, my, my label causes the data. Uh, covariate shift says my data causes the label. Um, you know, it, it's possible that your data really uh, does cause your label if your label was produced by Mechanical Turk or something and uh, you actually have a process that you, you push in a label and uh, uh, you're pushing an example and a label comes out. It's also possible that both assumptions hold. Um, so in the case where your labeling function is deterministic, uh, then covariate shift holds by definition always. Um, but label shift might also hold. And in uh, this work we showed that basically label shift is generally much easier to work with. So uh, what we showed is basically uh, if you take the confusion matrix of your classifier, um, you can now, um, if you look at say, now, now this is each column of this confusion matrix is equal to uh, let's say we're just, let's say we have the true confusion matrix, like the expected confusion matrix as you had, you know, an infinite amount of data. Each column of this confusion matrix is equal to the mean classifier output um, for a given label, right? So the first column might be, this is the mean classifier output when we have class one. Uh, this is the mean classifier output when the true label is class two. And, um, you know, the classifier, the classifier is just say some black box classifier off the shelf. That classifier, um, the statistics of the output of that classifier depend only on the example we feed into it. And because probability of x given y is equal to q of x given y, this confusion matrix is actually the same on the source data and on the target distribution, right? Because the only difference would be um, how much data we have for each column. But this is a column normalized confusion matrix. This is actually the same confusion matrix in the source time and in the target period, right? Now, um, that means that we can estimate it given data from the source task. Um, and then we can carry it over and pretend that this is a confusion matrix at the target period. Um, now, at the, with the data from the target period, from Q, we can't actually break apart the columns of the confusion matrix because we don't know what the labels are. But what we can do is we could just take our mean classifier output, right? So if this was actually the expected classifier output on the target data, and this is actually the confusion matrix of our classifier, it turns out that these guys form a nice linear system, and the solution to the linear system is a test set label distribution. Um, so in this case, um, the, the only assumption, additional assumption we need to make is that this uh, confusion matrix is invertible, which basically just says our classifier isn't like completely useless, but it's a pretty mild assumption. Um, uh, and then we just need to, to prove a bound, we just need to say, um, do some finite sample analysis because we don't actually get the expected confusion matrix and the expected classifier output. We just have to say, you know, if there's a little bit of the perturbation analysis, we have to say, what, what happens if we have to estimate this from, you know, you know 10,000 examples here and 1,000 examples there? Um, so in this case, it turns out that um, a change in the statistics of the classifier output is one to one with uh, there being a change in the label distribution. So it means, okay, we have ability to detect that there's a shift. We can estimate precisely what's the new label distribution. And because, you know, we've assumed that the only difference between the source and target task is um, a change in the label distribution, we can make the source data look like the target data by just reweighting the examples. So we can go back and retrain our classifier. So uh, we get to detect that there's a shift, estimate the shift, uh, and update our classifier all without seeing any labels from the target period. 
and end up doing you know, a much better job, especially when there's extreme shift. You might say, why do we do better when there's extreme shift? Because that, um, it turns out, well, if, there's ex you know, if we're starting from a uniform distribution and then one class comes to dominate, it's actually an easier problem, right? Because a blind classifier uh, would get very high accuracy, right? So that's why we do a good job. Um, so right, there's all kinds of approaches broadly under the uh, handle of sort of trying to do well um, in some deployment scenario when we don't have many labels from that distribution, right? Um, and um, specifically within domain adaptation, there's different types of assumptions you can make. There's a lot of work that studied the covariate shift assumption, which is the flip of what we talked about. There's people who have studied saying, what if you know, some kind of notion of divergence between uh, source and target distribution is capped? So there's great work by Ishai Mansour, great work by um, a new PhD student just joining Stanford named Wei Hua Hu that was published at ICML this year that looked at the class of F divergences. Um, right. um, you could broadly uh, put, um, you know, think of data augmentation, uh, even adversarial examples as similar kinds of assumptions. They're saying, hey, uh, it's, it's a domain adaptation problem, I have the same task, uh, but there's some kind of restriction on how the target data is allowed to be different from the source data. Maybe um, uh, it's, it, the perturbation um, is sort of, limited to like a class of functions we could apply that just like keeps, you know, it's equivalent to applying some function that can only move uh, examples within some, uh, you know, uh, norm ball or, or something like this. Um, uh, we had a recent paper, it's just on archive, um, with uh, specifically for like data augmentation um, with a student, um, actually not a student, but a, a junior scientist at Amazon AI, um, that showed that we can actually get nice performance dealing with additive noise and speech, uh, even in settings that we haven't encountered before, um, by n when we do data augmentation, not just requiring that examples get the same label, but actually penalizing differences in hidden representations, right? Um, so there's a lot to talk about there, but this talk, you know, I, I do want to, and where are we on time? How many minutes are we into? Huh? 934, great. So, so now I kind of want to dive, you know, into active learning a bit, just because that's, you know, sort of the, the main thrust of this talk. Um, but obviously, there's, there's, you know, you you could you could broadly enough construe almost anything as somehow trying to deal with data scarcity if it's at least trying to maximize performance subject to some data constraint. But kind of practically speaking, um, so. Um, in active learning, right, it, it, it's sort of a special case of, it, it's sort of related to semi-supervised learning. We're saying that we have a whole bunch of unlabeled data and um, we can only afford to label a subsection of it. But rather than it just being specified for us, we're going to try to say, can we strategically uh, um, choose, you know, what is the labeled subset? Now, it's actually known, like, the, the worst case scenarios for active learning are bad, right? So in the worst case scenario, like, there exists a David, I think, I believe it's, is it from, I don't know if it's just that, she wrote the overview or for her result, but um, I think Nina Balkan has this nice overview of active learning that articulates there's a, there's a theoretical result. Says, I think for any like acquisition function, I hope I'm not misstating it, um, there exists a data set such that it's going to do no better than IID sampling, right? Which is actually, it could be even worse. It could be that there is going to exist a data set that if you're doing anything other than IID sampling, you're going to do worse. Um, but it's still, um, you know, not so great. Um, on the other hand, uh, we're often not in the worst case scenario, right? So there's a question of, you know, in, in re with real data sets in general, right, um, can, can we do a good job? Um, there, it's sort of, there, there's obvious toy cases like simple thresholding problems where you could show that you could just do m like exponentially better in terms of sample complexity if you use active learning versus IID sampling. Uh, but you know, our question is can we, can, can we somehow, at least heuristically or empirically, get active learning to work on these like real high dimensional deep learning problems which are not characterized well, um, you know, theoretically. All right, so the basic setup for active learning um, is we're going to have this kind of loop, right, where we're going to have a huge amount of unlabeled data, um, and we're going to have some human annotator, and the cycle is going to look like this. We're going to have a number of rounds where we can uh, choose some examples, we'll call these our queries, to send to the human annotator. The human annotator is going to give us a label. We're going to add that label to the labeled uh, subset. We're going to train our model, and then, given the now updated model, we're going to choose a new uh, example or a new set of examples to annotate, right? Um, there's actually a few different variations. We're going to focus on this. This is actually called pool-based active learning. 
And um, this is something that's uh, easy for us to uh, kind of simulate by just taking a data set and sort of like withholding the labels. Um, there's a number of different uh, variations of the active learning problem, right? There's stream-based active learning where the instances are coming in and you basically, you don't get to just like hold on to them and at each stage look through all the instances and say, which ones do I want to label? But it's more like in real time, you have to decide, am I going to send something to the annotator or am I going to discard it? Um, there's also a sort of de novo variation of active learning where I would say, hey, actually I get to say it was, uh, you know, doing uh, image classification, I would get to create uh, a new image. Just any, anything in, uh, you know, 120,000 dimensions that, you know, would like, you know, bound it at the pixel, you know, sort of box constraints. Say, so, now this is, this is my image, I'm gonna send that to the annotator. Um, that's sort of a, a setup that's easier to reason about, I think, when you have like a sort of toy thresholding problem or a 2D case, and it's much harder to say, um, you know, how we're gonna synthesize reasonable images, say, when we're, you know, actually, actually talking about, you know, reasonable examples when we're talking about images. Um, although, you know, with all the excitement about generative modeling, um, I'm, I'm sure there's plenty of people thinking about, can we, can we synthesize an image? You know, can we, like, synthesize a counterfactual or something like that? And then, you know, send it to the annotator and say, say this image existed in the data set, what label should it get? Uh, the problem, though, it tends to be that, like, if you end up synthesizing only nonsense, then uh, you'll get a bunch of labels for you know, nonsense. Um, and, and the space of natural looking data is a lot smaller than the space of all possible pixel values. Right? So the, the things we have to consider with active learning are uh, the acquisition function. So how are we gonna score the examples at each point? Right? At, at, each, at each round of training, how are we gonna say which uh, examples should be queried, which should not? Um, we also have a question of um, the, you know, the, the number of queries per round. So uh, basically, this tends to be, like in the, in the most naive conception, we just say, I'm gonna take an example, I'm gonna send it to the annotator, I'm gonna get a label, I'm gonna add it to my training set, I'm gonna retrain my classifier, I'm gonna get another example. And you know, if I'm talking about 10,000 examples and training a linear model, um, maybe that's fine. Maybe I could retrain a linear model 10,000 times. Uh, if what you're talking about is I need to train like 100 epochs to train like a computer vision model to convergence, um, then we have to take a, a shortcut. The, the easiest hack is to say, well, I'm gonna sample a thousand examples. Uh, I'm gonna get these a thousand guys labeled. I'm gonna add them to the training set. Then I'm gonna retrain the classifier. And then if I need you know, 10,000 labels, okay, I've got 10 rounds. If I need 50,000 labels, I've got uh, 50 rounds, but I'm not like retraining my classifier 50,000 times, where if that took even an hour, then, then we're really in trouble, right? Um, another issue that comes up in the context of deep learning, right, for this is, uh, what am I going to do between rounds? Am I going to just initialize the classifier with uh, the most recent weights uh, from the last round, or am I going to train from scratch? Um, this is a, actually turns out to be an important consideration, and um, we've sort of asked this experiment in each paper we've done in this area to say, you know, can you get away with fine tuning? And um, it seems that it depends a bit on the problem. So we found in some problems uh, that retraining from scratch. Uh, was the better approach. Uh, in, in other case, in the, the danger you'd think would be, hey, I collect one example, I add it to my data set from like the first round. Then I train my classifier. Now I'm gonna get a bunch of new examples, I'm gonna retrain my classifier again, and I have some examples that have been sitting around across all 50,000 rounds of training or something. Like at some point, I, you know, the worry is that like you've, in, in the sense that early stopping is a, is a thing that you want to do and that tends to confer some kind of generalization, in deep learning, you think that like there are some examples now that like you're, when you get to the very end, there's some examples that were labeled recently that like you've stopped after showing into the classifier 20 times or 10 times or whatever, however many epochs there were in the final round. And then there's some examples that have been hanging out the entire time. And if you keep fine tuning on them over and over and over again, and these examples sort of might get like uh, disproportionately overfit. Um, one important thing uh, that comes up here is um, that supervised learning gets you, lets you get away with murder. And I think this is something that's making us like a little bit sloppy when we start thinking about domain adaptation, when we start thinking about active learning. When we start thinking about anything that's not supervised learning, I think we forget that like supervised learning, um, so long as we can get away with multiple hypothesis testing, which seems like by some miracle when our holdout sets are really big, like we sort of can get away with. Um, you know, supervised learning, let's just say, I'm gonna do anything. 
And if it improves like this, like a, the the performance on a large holdout set, uh, that's great. And, and even like you know, in a production scenario, say I can, I'm going to try ten thousand things, and ninety nine percent of them won't work. But I could just keep trying. You know, I've collected my data. Now I have the modeling phase where we're going to do graduate student descent, and I'm just going to keep uh, trying every single heuristic I know. I'm going to try every model I know, and and hopefully something is going to work. And then once it works. I'm pretty confident, like you know, that I get something to work on, like a giant data set. You know, it's going to work in the wild so long as like there's not distribution shift. Um, the problem with active learning here is, keep in mind, our training process is tied to our labeling, right? If we somehow screw up and um, do like a really bad job and collect an uh, uninformative somehow subset of the data, um, then basically. We don't get another shot. Like the whole point of active learning is saying, like we we have some fixed annotation budget, right? Subject to that annotation budget, what's the best we could do? Um, so you don't get to say, I'm going to try 15 different active learning strategies. Uh, I'm going to try 19,000 different models, and for each one, I'm going to go and say, like when I spend my budget, how good am I doing, right? The 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 challenge is. You know, basically, you got one shot. Like, if your budget is whatever, that means you get to train that model with that strategy once. You don't get to retrospectively look and say, of the 15 strategies, one of them did better than IID. Let's, you know, go back and choose to live in that universe where we made that decision and didn't look at the others. And you have to be confident enough that you're cool not knowing the counterfactual, like not knowing what if I tried a different strategy. Um, so uh, I guess first, I'm going to kind of give an overview of some active learning stuff and give an overview of um, sort of some of the basics and, and, and a paper that uh, we had that got some nice empirical result, but then also um, just briefly discuss the results of two recent drafts that we have that actually try to ask these critical questions of like, if we, if we evaluate these things under realistic scenarios, given that you know, we could really only try things once, do we have any reason to believe it'll actually work? And the results are mixed. Um, right, so there's a lot of different acquisition functions there's, uh, that people try. Um, sort of classical approaches, you say one thing is you say I'm going to do like least confidence. This means I'm going to look at my predicted distribution over the classes. And I'm going to say that um, what's the prediction? You know, so say the prediction is cat, like that's the argmax, right? So I say what's the probability assigned to cat? If that's 0.6, that's how confident the classifier is. And I'm going to say that I want to, in, in the idea of uncertainty based sampling, um, I should have a hyphen between uncertainty and based, but you know, I'll. Uh, I'll let myself off the hook on account of the ear. Um, so, um, right, if the, if the probability assigned to cat is, say, 0.6, um, and that is the least probability assigned out of any prediction in my data set, I say that is the one that the model is most uncertain about, right? Um, the, the intuition of the uncertainty based sampling approaches is to say that, like, I should, um, if I'm already 100% sure it's a cat, I shouldn't waste my annotation budget adding this to the data set. I should focus on some example where the classifier, um, say, isn't sure, right? Um, now, th there are some problems here, right? Like, uh, say that there's uh, intrinsic noise in some regions of input space, some like irreducible intrinsic noise. You could have a pathological case where there's just some region of input space that no matter how many examples you sample from it, it's just like the, the label is a coin toss there. And you could end up, basically, the classifier will rightly learn that that region of input space is like, the best you could do is output a uniform distribution. And then you could wind up spending your entire sampling budget over there. On the other hand, if you believe that um, the, there exists some you know, deterministic labeling function out there, then, then that you know, wipes that possibility off. So it's, it's worth considering there, there exist pathological data sets um, for any of these even like classical heuristics, and it's worth considering whether or not your particular problem is one where you could potentially face one, right? Um, a related heuristic is maximum entropy. It's just uh, um, these become the same thing if you're doing binary classification. But basically, least confidence just looks at the just looks at the the argmax, looks at the component of the output distribution corresponding to the um, to the, the predicted class. And maximum entropy looks at the uh, just the entropy of the sort of softmax distribution that says what you know um, the more entropic it is, the more uncertain the classifier. Um, uh, a recent approach. So th these guys, right? They don't incorporate any kind of notion of uncertainty over the parameters of the model. Uh, they just look at the predictive distribution of the classifier. 
Uh, more recently, in uh, approaches to estimating uncertainty in the context of uh, neural networks, um, there's a bunch of works that try to say, can we incorporate some uh, notion of um, like a, a Bayesian neural network or, you know, um, via one of a couple different approaches to say, I, I, can, I can use uh, my uncertainty over the parameters of the neural network to get out multiple predictions over like different samples. Um, so the idea is to say, somehow I have a stochastic neural network. I'm going to sample multiple times from it. And the Bayesian active learning by disagreement heuristic says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to generate multiple predictions from the model across multiple different samples. And I'm going to look and say, what is the most popular prediction? And what fraction of votes agree on that, right? So I say, OK, I, I generated uh, 50 predictions. Uh, I generated 100 predictions. And 40 of uh, the most popular vote getter was cat. And 40% you know, of votes said it was cat. 10% you know, said it was zebra, and 5% said it was antelope or something like this. So, but like, I, I look at basically the, the, the percentage of uh, agreement, the amount of agreement on the, on the, on the most popular uh, choice. Um, so that's the approach that was used um, by Yaron Gall in, in this paper uh, addressing uh, 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 sort of Bayesian active learning for, for image data. Uh, interestingly, on image data, the classic uncertainty sampling approaches uh, seem, and, and we've confirmed this in, in, in a number of different uh, tests, seem not to really give much of an advantage over IID sampling. Um, but the uh, Bayesian active learning approaches seem to actually give an advantage um, on a number of different vision problems. So the idea of the dropout method here is this is based on some analysis that Yarin did that uh, showed some connections uh, potentially between like stochastically regularized neural networks and Gaussian processes. And they make some argument that the, the way you sample from a dropout regularized neural network is that what you do is you sample different dropout masks. So you train the neural network with dropout. And then at prediction time, you sample different dropout mass. So normally, dropout is a technique right, where you zero out uh, some fraction of the nodes uh, during training. right? So you sort of are, are sampling from the set of neural networks that have you know, uh, roughly you know, half the, the neurons blacked out in each layer. Um, and typically, what people do is they, they use this heuristic during training. Uh, the intuition is it like stops like co-adaptation or like tight coupling of the because like you know this layer can't assume you know which of the many possible layers below it was sampled on that particular pass through the neural network. Um, it's sort of a, a heuristic that seems to work really well, um, but normally f for purposes of regularization, what people normally do is they train with dropout and then at prediction time you use all of the nodes to make your prediction and just you know half the weights or half the activations. Um, so their, their uh, idea is to say their analysis suggests that you can maybe get samples from a neural network by you actually use dropout at prediction time. So you, you sample different dropout masks. You make a forward pass for each different dropout mask. You get a different prediction. And now I'm going to look and use the Bayesian active learning by disagreement heuristic and say, you know, uh, what is the most popular vote getter and how much do they agree? Um, another approach to getting uncertainty estimates out of a neural network is an approach due to Blundell um, from, or Blundell. Um, However, uh, if he's out there, apologies. Uh, of DeepMind and colleagues, I think uh, with, uh, Julian Cornebise, uh also on this paper, and what they show is basically uh, an alternative approach to getting uh, uncertainty estimates out of a neural network is what you say is uh, instead of just having a single value of each weight during training, and you say, I just, oh, this, this, you know, this weight's value is 0.5, and then on the next round, you know, I'm going to take the gradient of the loss with respect to this weight. And, move it up a little bit or move it down a little bit, what you're going to do is for each uh, parameter in the neural network, you're now going to have two parameters. Uh, one is going to be a mean, one is a variance. So you're basically going to say it's a, the, the neural network is now probabilistic. Um, and the procedure for generating samples is quite simple. What you're going to do is now basically each weight is an independent Gaussian. And the way I'm going to make predictions from the neural network is I'm going to sample a set of weights, each one from its corresponding uh, you know, uh, two-parameter Gaussian distribution. Then I'm going to feed through an example, get a prediction, um, and I could get some kind of uncertainty estimate in the same way by just saying I'm going to take multiple samples of uh, the weights, each from their respective distributions. Um, and you know, it tends to uh, work nicely in practice. Um, I had a paper when I was working on reinforcement learning. Um, another area where estimating uncertainty from a neural network is useful is when you're doing exploration and reinforcement learning. You want to 
you know, explore those spaces where the model is most uncertain about, say, the value of the Q function or something. Um, and we had nice results uh, exploring by Thompson sampling using these Bayes by backprop networks. Um, in that case, uh, you just now uh, basically you wind up uh, saying, well, what I want to do is I have a probabilistic neural networks. So I'm going to use the reparameterization trick. Say I want to optimize uh, the divergence between my variational parameter uh, distribution and the, the true posterior distribution. And you come up with this loss function, which basically turns out to, you know, like with a lot of variational stuff, be a like sort of look a little bit like a fancy regularizer plus your normal likelihood function. Um, so, uh, you know, in, in a first kind of very empirical work published at ICLR this year, we looked at saying, um, could we get some advantage for named entity recognition? Named entity recognition is a task where basically you have a number of um, tags that uh, correspond to entities. So you actually normally have like, this is the beginning of, of a new entity, and this is an internal tag in the same entity. Um, and you know, you might have different tags for say locations or times or places or people or currencies or things like this, certain uh, things you want to track, right? So phrases like, um, you know, okay, Berlin Academy of Sciences is an organization, something like that. Um, and lots of different people want to perform named entity recognition for, you know, maybe they're doing reviews and they want to identify products. Maybe they're doing medical things and they want to identify diagnoses or treatments or whatever. Um, not everyone has 625,000 labeled words. So our idea was to say, you know, can, can we do much better? Um, so the first step that we had, and, and I won't go too much into details, is basically um, doing many, many, many rounds of active learning was very expensive. So we want to say, can we make a faster neural network that would get comparable performance? So that way we could actually afford to train it 20 times because training in LSTM or like, you know, complicated, uh, you know, uh, character and word uh, and sentence encoding model with like multiple by LSTMs in it uh, ultimately like took, you know, many, many days to train and we wanted to train it like 20 times or 40 times. Um, so we ended up uh, finding that we could get comparable performance replacing almost all the recurrent connections except for in the very top decoder layer with convolutions. Um, we, uh, using active learning in the context of a sequence labeling task, we had this problem that basically, um, if you look at what's your probability over the label sequence for each sentence, um, then you'll find that like you're least, you're least confident in general about longer sentences because the probability that you get the entire tag sequence, you know, it's just like every word, every, every prediction you have is another opportunity to get things wrong. So what we do is we just normalize the log probabilities by the length of the sentence just because uh, we don't want to have a, a model that has this weird bias that it only collects long sentences during labeling. Also because our labeling budget is proportional, we figure, to the amount of words that people have to annotate, not to the amount of sentences that people have to annotate. Um, we also compared it to this uh, Bayesian active learning by disagreement approach using specifically the dropout technique. Um, and the results we got were pretty nice. Um, so what it showed is um, the, the, the lower dotted line here, and this is on English and this is on the Chinese version of the data set, the lower dotted line here is like basically the best performance you could get out of the linear model, right? The higher dotted line here is like the 100% of the data performance that you get out of the, the best deep model. And you see that um, th this line over here is, the, is like just doing IID sampling, right? So this basically shows that, you know, um, not surprisingly, to, to get to the 100% mark using IID sample, you really have to label about 100% of the data. Um, and what's cool is that we showed that we got within striking distance with about 25% of the data just using our simple kind of like sequence adapted version of an uncertainty sampling heuristic. Um, and it did more or less the same performance as the Bayesian active learning by disagreement on this particular task. Um, and we saw comparable results on the uh, Chinese variant of the task. Um, so again, right, the problems are active learning sounds great on paper, but we've painted a cartoonish picture of annotation. Um, hindsight is 2020, but not foresight. Um, and, and, and so we want to sort of get a sense really of like, does this actually work? So among the ways that we're sort of telling a lie, right, is that when we have these papers that say we grabbed this uh, popular neural network architecture, we took a popular data set, we pretended that we don't see the labels, and we now we're going to do active learning, is that, well, the labels were known. And the labels informed the whole development of the techniques we're using, including the precise architecture and hyperparameters that are available to us, right? So we say, hey, I took this ResNet, which works really well on CIFAR, but then I pretended I didn't see the CIFAR labels. Um, 
But what if I go to a new data set where I don't have an architecture that was already like over optimized to that particular data set, which is the whole point, right? I, I, I don't have access to the labels for purposes of peaking and choosing my architecture, right? Um, the other question is like, these results seem nice, but are they specific to this particular task? So um, I had a student who's uh, Aditya Sedant, who's a, a, a master's student at um, CMU now and is a um, very talented engineer. And um, uh, we started, we actually, our, our goal was to sort of, we wanted to investigate new ac acquisition functions, but he was so efficient at implementing the baselines that uh, at some point it became an opportunity to actually do like a really large scale study and say, does any of this work at all? Um, so we ended up getting, um, basically implementing Bayes-wide backprop, including vari variants, which hadn't been done, at least in active learning, on like recurrent neural networks. Um, uh, implementing the, the dropout approach, implementing um, the, the, the classical kinds of approaches. And then what we looked at and said was, hey, um, we're going to look at multiple tasks. We looked at like four different tasks. For each task, we looked at at least two data sets. So we have like four tasks times two data sets. For each task and data set, we're going to look at multiple models. And for each task, data set, and model, we're going to look at multiple acquisition functions. And we're also going to execute multiple runs to determine the variance over the runs. Right? And try to get a sense of, OK, once you get out to this extreme where you're considering multiple tasks, multiple models for each task, uh, multiple models, uh, tasks, and most, sorry, multiple tasks, multiple data sets for each task, multiple models for each data set, um, and every single of the set of acquisition functions, and then running these checks to see like, how much variance is there across the runs and how sensitive is this to you know, getting lucky with a random seed, uh, you wind up doing about 3,000 experiments. Uh, and each experiment, sorry, and then each experiment consists of retraining the model at each of a number stage. And, and our goal was to say, and even though I've done a bit of work in this area, I have to be honest that like as sort of a bit of a skeptic of everything, my, my sort of inclination was to be like, we're going to show that active learning, um, like I suspect we're going to show that active learning doesn't work at all for um, anything, you know, if you give an honest comparison, just because, you know, that's the nature of honest comparisons, right? Um, and I was actually a bit surprised. So um, basically, um, so what we did was we, you know, a, a, a common approach, and we, which we had used in a previous paper that I mentioned, is that um, what you do is you start off with some small seed of data, some small amount of IID data that's used to initially train the classifier before you start using the classifier to choose samples. Um, how are we doing on time? OK, I'll, I'll wrap up pretty soon. Um, and basically, what we showed. Um, so what we did is we used a small amount of warm start data to choose all of the hyperparameters to say, like, this is all you've got. You've got the 2% of data. You have to use that 2% of the data to, do, to choose your learning rate, to choose everything. Um, so uh, interestingly, we replicate the results from the previous study um, pretty closely. Um, but that finding, like that finding that you see here, that um, the conventional uncertainty sampling and the Bayesian active learning by disagreement do uh, kind of similar to each other is actually like a special case. Um, in general, the Bayesian active learning approaches tend to do much better uh, than the regular uncertainty sampling, and that just happened to be the result um, on on two notes with this particular architecture, with this particular data set. So it's um, it's still like a nice finding that like active learning worked on on this data set, but actually, you know, painting this fuller picture across multiple uh, models, data sets, tasks, whatever. Uh, paints maybe a more refined picture that actually, um, in general, across, across all these different techniques, that, that bald tends to be um, a better approach. And, and, and interestingly, we found that there did not appear to be significant differences between how well uh, Bayes by backprop versus the dropout variants of bald did. Um, which overall, given that Bayes by backprop is maybe a little bit more finicky and has more choices to make, whereas dropout's a bit more out of the box and default, might actually be suggestive that if you wanted to use this in practice, that the dropout approach is slightly favored. Um, or at least it would be easier to implement. Um, yeah, I guess spending a PhD between industry and uh, academia, I've uh, seen that, you know, like complexity is a buzzword in academia. And then, like, when people actually build things, simple is a buzzword. Um, so it's like anyone can do it. It becomes uh, a, 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 a grounds for rejection um, sometimes in academia. but it becomes uh, sort of an appealing thing if you have to get a large team of engineers to implement something. Um, so the next kind of sobriety test, 
And, and this one, the results are not quite as positive, although the results are a bit preliminary. Um, this is in a paper on the archive. I should have put the link here. Um, is uh, with a, um, a friend who's a professor at uh, Northeastern, Byron Wallace, and a student, David Lowell. And, and, and the question is to say, um, if we're going to think really seriously about actually doing active learning, then there's this question about, um, you know, what's going to happen after you train your model? So I use my model. I use it to actively query a bunch of uh, examples to get labels. I come up with a model. It's got decent performance. It's, uh, what's today? August 6th? It's August 6th, 2018. And then in like September 6th, 2018, um, I don't know, like Anima's got a student who comes out with like the next new, like great, uh, slightly improved, you know, LSTM model for, for the task that we're working on. And I say, oh, let's switch to using that model. All right, so the question is, are, when, we, when we now switch models, are we going to train that model on the same data? that we collected by doing active learning in the first place. Um, so it's worth pointing out, right, these uncertainty sampling based heuristics, which are pretty popular, they are based on the properties of the model that you are training, right? So like, I am training the model, and based on the particular model, like based on that particular architecture, uh, you know, I, I look at that model and I say, so I have some, some notion of uncertainty, which is like a, a property of the data set and the model. And that determines which examples I select. So basically, I come away with a sampled subset where the choice of that subset is tightly coupled with what was the model that I used to do the training. And the question was, if I were to switch models now, if I were to switch from model A to model B, how transferable is the active set? And it seems that the answer is that the uh, preliminary answer, and we haven't tried this with the Bayesian active learning approaches. This is with on a variety of NLP tasks with the conventional uncertainty sampling approaches. On those, it seems that you know, we get the familiar result that for each model, when you do active learning, you do better than IID performance. But if you then made a grid of you know, what was the model used to acquire the data and what was the model that you trained subsequently, the off-diagonal entries tend to do more often. They, they, they definitely do uh, worse than if you use that model to collect the data. And uh, very often, they do worse than even having IID data. So this is an important like, practical consideration if you want to do active learning. Now, as you have to say, what has a longer shelf life, data or models? Um, if the model, uh, if it turns out that like you're in some kind of setting where you constantly have to keep labeling your data, and the data from this month is going to be stale next month anyway, and you'll need to do learning again, then that might not be a problem. But if you're in a setting where like you know, I guess us in academia are like especially lethargic, where we're you know, uh, like our our new data set is still like ImageNet or something, which is introduced maybe 10 years ago. Um, if you're in that kind of setting where you plan to keep training different models on the same data, then you actually might want to make a very different kind of decision. Um, so, you know, briefly, just summarizing, um, you know, there, there's a number of other approaches in this direction of doing active learning with deep learning that are worth checking out. There's a paper by Wong, which is nice, that um, tries to combine pseudo labeling with active learning. So, what they do is, uh, uh, yeah. Well, so that's actually, um, so in our experiments, we don't. We're just kind of trying to ask one question at a time. But this paper actually does look at that, right? So what they look at is pseudo labeling, which is a semi supervised learning technique. What you say is, I'm going to take those examples that I'm confident about, uh, apply like a fake label, like, you know, basically look at the unlabeled set, apply my classifier to it. When the model's really confident, then pretend that's the real label and add it to the data set. So what they do is, um, so just by itself, like that kind of approach is sometimes called like label propagation. Like you say, I'll take the confident ones, add them to the labeled data set, retrain my classifier, now run it on the unlabeled data set again, find the one that's now confident on. The idea is it could start to uh, exploit the fact that like some of the unlabeled ones are so similar to some of the labeled ones, and now this expands like your frontier for each class, and you could keep adding more and more samples. Um, in this approach, that's what they're doing there. They're, they're doing a pseudo labeling, which is a conventional like semi-supervised approach. And then they're also doing active learning. So like the unconfident ones, you do active learning. The confident ones, you do pseudo-labeling. Um, I think it's a, a worthwhile direction to investigate to say, um, OK, say, say you've got a large amount of data and you can only label this much, um, but you now can additionally do semi-supervised learning when you train the final classifier, right? How good can we uh, get? Um, it's, it, it's, it's, it's worth asking. It, it seems like. 
like it should strictly improve things. It should strictly improve the story for active learning because you always have the option of ignoring uh, that data. So um, yeah, so there's a number of different approaches. Um, yeah, so right, we've, we've done a number of other things to just very briefly summarizing is that the, when selecting, actually applying labels, you don't actually get to say to someone, hey, give me the label of, of 1,000 categories. The Amazon Mechanical Turk worker hasn't memorized your 1,000 categories. So if anyone actually knows how ImageNet was created, they didn't say to the Turk workers, um, what class of 1,000 that I care about that you don't know about you know, in my taxonomy that you've never heard of is this? They show a picture and say, is this a Burmese cat? So they ask binary questions, yes, no questions, and then you get a bunch of votes across different crowd workers and they aggregate them. So ImageNet was created by first, get, creating a list of categories, two, using Google image search to create a short list of candidates. So maybe I have like 3,000 candidates for Burmese cat, and then I'm using Mechanical Turk to just ask people, is this a Burmese cat or not? So if you actually wanted to apply labels, um, you might need to do something a bit more like 20 questions. Um, like you don't actually get to ask the person, is this a Burmese cat? You get to say, is this a mammal? Okay, is it a domestic mammal? Okay, it's a domestic animal. Is it a, a feline? You know, is it a canine? Um, so what we tried to do is basically say, you know, what if what you get to do is you get to ask the annotator, uh, you, you have access to a hierarchy of classes, you get to ask them, um, does this example belong to this class? Like, is this a dog? Is this, and you know, the naive thing to do would be to start at the top of the hierarchy and try to drill all the way down until you found the bottom class. But if your classifier was already sure, if it only assigned like non-zero probability to dogs, then maybe you don't want to start at, is this a natural object? You want to skip all the way to species of dogs, right? So um, what we did in this work is basically try to say, um, you know, if you could just ask these sort of example class pairs, how well can you do? And we show that you can annotate the data quickly um, and you could do a good job. And in other work with uh, our um, uh, intern Ashish Katan, we looked at, you know, what if we uh, model the fact that actually annotators give you noisy data? And then you have a choice between, well, how should I allocate my annotation budget? Should I try to get many, as many labels as possible but have really noisy labels? Or should I redundantly label examples and use conventional crowdsourcing algorithms to try to uh, eliminate the noise? And the, the, the short of the story is that um, label once and moving on is a better strategy if you use our algorithm. So, um, but basically, uh, you know, you're, you're better off sampling as many different examples and getting, you know, you're better off uh, getting uh, a million uh, examples noisily annotated than getting 100,000 examples like 10 times over, you know, uh, redundantly annotated and getting clean labels but for one tenth the amount of data. Um, so anyway, I think uh, uh, Anima has uh, some, some other exciting work to present to you and so I'm gonna end my portion of the talk right here but it was nice to spend the morning with you and uh, hope to chat with you later. <laughs>